Okay, so um, today's the Day of Atonement. It's a, obviously a very special day in the feast circuit. And we've been covering trumpets. And obviously trumpets moves right into atonement because there are certain things that has to be done. Um, and actually, when they're done, it, they actually move us into a place of connection. And that's what atonement is. And the English word atonement, if you look at it, it's, it's three words put together. And it's at one mint. Okay? At one mint. People have been saying that forever. But understanding how things come together is is um is paramount. So now <clears throat> to atonement. Okay, so today um um trumpets lead right to, to atonement. We were talking about atonement, and if we remember atonement now, we're we're talking about a um your higher self and you coming you, if you coming into one with your higher self. So if we if we go back and look at what we were talking about, we were talking about the trumpet being the message that the Malachim brings to you. Now, if you look at if you look at your higher self, as we were talking, the higher self or or the priest, which we said is your higher self, ministers in the temple, in the holy place. Now you are the temple. You gotta connect with that which is in you already which is your higher man. But in, in, the, in, the most, in the holy place, the higher man ministers in the holy place there inside the temple and, and, the, and, and has um, jurisdiction over the altar of incense because he's the one who lights, or they're the ones who light the incense, okay? Um, has jurisdiction over the lampstand because they're the one who tends to the lampstand. They have jurisdiction over the table of showbread and the showbread because they're the ones who put them there and they're the ones who put the bake the bread and everything. Now, these are not objects. The showbread, the, um, the lampstand, and the, the, uh, the altar of incense, these are not objects. Yet in Moshe's, how Moshe set them up, yes, they were objects because he created, he made physical things off a pattern, which was a spirit pattern, a spiritual pattern. So, but if we think about it, all these are Malachim. These are all elementals. We have the four horns of the, um, the, the, um, the altar of incense, which you could break down to the four living creatures, the four elements, all that. We have the seven lamp lampstand, which you could break down to the four Malachim. Okay, or the se I'm, I'm sorry, the seven Malachim, um, who actually received a message from the 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 uh, one of the living creatures, which is one of the four, who then gave it to one of the twenty-four elders, which is which the twenty-four elders basically is talking about the twelve showbread, okay, which is part of your body, twenty-four uh, cranial nerves, which is actually um, pairs of the pairs that we we got there. So these these twelve, um, two two, um, sorry, twelve pairs of this cranial nerve is what we talked about. This turns out to be the um, the twenty four elders. So these aren't objects. These are actually uh, ministering spirits, if you will, that come out and do what you, the higher self wants them to do. And the, and the higher self is inside the holy place, tending to the lamp, tending to the, the showbread, and tending to the altar of incense. And these are not objects. These are servants that are being used to do things. So now we, we, we got that. Now, coming into atonement means we come into one mint again, and we have we are in connection now with this higher self. And if we're in connection with this higher self, we all of a sudden have connection to control the elements. And this is what you saw Yahshua do. 
He had control over the elements, which was the altar of incense, or that which the altar of incense is representing, the seven lamp lampstand, or that which it's representing, and the message, or the, the covenant, or the showbread, which is what the showbread is representing those messengers who come to you with messages. So Yahshua had all this. He came into connection, and he made sure that um, these, these are the areas where he now found himself having control, having control over all of these. So in atonement, we're going to go over to um, Numbers uh, 29 for our first scripture today, 29. And of course, this is where the law is. And if we are able to look at the law, then we're able to look further into some of the things that um, um, Yahshua had to say. So first, let's go over to Numbers 29, and we're going to look at verse 7, for our first scripture, verse 7. Okay, and it says here, On the tenth day of the seventh moon, you shall have a holy convocation. Now remember in trumpets, how do we have the con the convocation? If you remember, it's by the trumpet. The trumpet, okay, um, is blown by the priest, or the priest is in charge of that. But the trumpet is simply an instrument, which is a mess, which is the messenger with the message. So remember when Yahshua came now, and Yahshua was speaking to Yachanan, Yahshua sent forth his Malik with a message, like a trumpet, to Yachanan. Okay. So this is all inside of Yachanan, though. It's happening inside of Yachanan, okay? Because the power is in Yachanan. And Yachanan, through what he connects within himself, he could move through space and time, okay? Because he's not taking a physical body. He's taking a spirit, his higher self, that is not subject to space and time. So here we have now Moshe, and he says... So this holy convocation has to be brought forth by the trumpet. Because we read it in trumpets that this is what the two uh, silver horns are for. When they're blown, you know, when you want to gather the congregation, it's going to be a particular um, tone that is blown on this, these trumpets when you want that. So he goes, you should have a holy convocation. You shall afflict your souls, you shall do, and you shall do, do not do any work at all on that day. So here goes now. Now, afflicting our souls, there's a, lot to, there's a lot in there. Now, if we look at it physically, physically, when we're tired or when we're hungry, we're at our crankiest, where we want some food because um, we, get, we get tired, we don't have the energy, we don't have... We don't have the tolerance, so we become cranky. Well, this is how you do in the physical body, okay? And when you do that, you're allowing yourself to see what lives in there, what lives in your emotional body. And you're allowing your mind to, if you can, to control your emotions. You control the things that are happening. Or so, you, that, so now all of a sudden you see things that live in you, whether it's frustration, whether it's anger, whether it's impatience. When you afflict yourself by not eating physical food, the body wants that. And then you can see what's living in that body, which is a city. Okay, now think of it now as a much wider spectrum. Just don't think of it as one person or myself or yourself. Think of it as a body and what a body has to go through. So now it's not your body, but you are a part of a body that has to go through the same afflicting of the soul on the Day of Atonement, on the day that you become one. Now, remember now, after atonement comes tabernacles. This is when rewards are given out. Okay, because then you will you will be in booths. These booths are the offices that you're going to be in. Okay, so now the trumpet is blown, and the trumpet is blown because this is the Malachim getting us ready 
to go into this area right here to um, to to be at one or atone. So we're not going to look at the individual atonement now. We're going to look at the, in the the atonement for the body. We are all members of a body. So now this body now has to actually become afflicted before it goes into tabernacles. It has to become afflicted. If you're wondering why, we have to go through great tribulation before we acquire salvation. This is the reason, because this is the body that has to be afflicted. It has to go through tribulation. Now, part of what it's going to go through is all the, the niceties that we have been used to having, all the food of this world or whatever we like to eat, we're going to have to abstain from that. But we're not going to, um, we're, we're not going to be in a place that we just come and say, okay, we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to do that. No circumstances and situations are going to take place, and we're going to make the choice to do that which will, will take place when a troubling time will come. We will be doing certain things. Because we received a message, which is a trumpet, we now, because of that, we are going to move into a place where our scripture says we are nourished for time, time, and dividing of times, and you can only be nourished by the food that heaven provides, which is the showbread. That's the only thing we can get, the manna that comes from heaven during that time. So the woman is taken to her place where she's nourished. She's nourished by the food from heaven. That's what happens. Now, we continue to go here. Okay, so inflicting our souls don't just mean this day right here is Moshe set up, but it's telling us things that we're going to face as individual parts of the body. We're simply going to run into that because that's all part of afflict, get becoming afflicted. Okay, in verse 8. Now, during that time, Okay, but you are to sacrifice a burnt offering to Yahweh as a pleasing aroma, and a burnt offering is when you totally give yourself up. I totally give myself up. Whatever I'm doing is what the Father said, because that is what's pleasing to my Father. Yahshua said he does what his Father says to do, and he pleases his Father. That's why his Father does what he tell, he asks to be done. What does he do? He does only what he sees and what he hears coming from the Father. That is a key point here. To get ourselves, because we will not be able to bring forth that sacrifice. The sacrifice of a burnt offering, which this burnt offering is going to be, you, you, are, you are sending in your awareness, and this awareness is pleasing to the Father because the only way we could, we, could ascend, um, we could ascend in awareness or consciousness is if we make the sacrifices. Now, if you remember, this man, um, he went to give his sacrifice. Um, Yahshua said, if you go to give your sacrifice, okay, any one of us, not only his apostles, and there at the altar, you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your sacrifice there and go and make amends with your brother, then come back and give that sacrifice. Well, the reason why you have to leave the sacrifice there and go do something first, fix certain things, and then come back is because the sacrifice will not be accepted. There's no way it's going to be accepted. If, if we're not taking that sacrifice, that's going to be a true burnt offering, that's going to be a sweet-smelling aroma to our Father, it's not going to be accepted. So the things that our, our brothers, our, we did against our brother, and we know that our, we have done wrong, whatever it is. And not only our brother, we're talking about when we're not doing something that, that we, our Father have told us to do, which is also comes down to... Um, doing something against our brother because our brother is not just the physical brother that's moving around here, but our brother is also um, Yahshua. 
Yahshua is our big brother. And he has given the command to follow him. So that command to follow him now, when we don't do that, we also offend in that manner. So we're going to go on a little further here. So this, this sacrifice, notice what this sacrifice has to be, guys. We've gone over this many times, so I don't really have to go into it. It's, a, it's one young bull. It's a young bull. We know what that symbolizes. So we have a young bull, and this young bull, okay, and then, it, then it says, and a ram, and we looked at that also, what that meant, okay? And it says, it says, a total of seven lambs of the first year. See that? Seven lambs of the first year. Okay, notice what is here we say now. Of the first year, be sure they are without blemish. Now, we went over that blemish deal, and the blemish simply means that we're only doing what we see and we hear. That's all we're doing. That is because that is where we get our blemishes when we do something that we didn't see, we do something that we didn't hear, we did something that the Father didn't tell us to do, or, or we didn't do something that he told us to do. That's all your blemish comes down to be. And your blemish could only be when you understand these things. If you don't understand it, you can't have a blemish in that manner. Okay. Well, you may not be true chosen because we don't have the understanding and awareness yet. We're too young. We're not ready. Okay, but you can only have a blemish that it, for, the, for the sacrifice because we simply are not doing what we're told to do. Our conscience is not clear when it comes to what the Father has told us to do, and this is where our blemish um, comes in. Okay, so here now it tells us, okay, um, with the bull, prepare a grain offering, three-tenths of an ephod, we went over that, with trumpets, a fine flour mixed with oil, with the ram, went over that too, the grain offering is to be two-tenths of an ephod, of, of fine flour mixed with oil. Okay, so the ephod, if you remember now, is the perfect standard. There's only one who has the standard of perfection, the scripture says, so if you will enter into life, keep the commandments. In other words, do what we have heard and what we have seen coming from the Father. And who displayed that? Who expressed that in the earth? Who, the individual who expressed that in the earth was the one who lived in here, Yeshua. He's not the only one, but he's the one that's in this Bible right here that I'm reading. So if you, you want to find something and you want to look at it, this is, this is the book that you're reading, well, he's not the only one that said it, okay, because it wasn't only given to him to say it, but he did say it. He showed you. So anybody who you hear saying the same thing or read, you're reading something and it's the same thing, they all have the same spirit. That same spirit is bringing certain things out, out within them. And this is where we are. So that's a perfect standard. Um, and it's, And with this... This, the, with with this, um, this ram, which is a symbol of the strength, it's a grain offering. And remember we talked about the grain offering? The grain offering being the finest. They go through the sieves, and then they're able to make this, this lump of, of dough. Then they grab a certain portion of the dough in the, ha in the hand, and this portion that they take out is considered the holiest of the holy. This is what they're doing. And with that, this is where the sacrifice is, the, the, um, the offering is made with this grain offering that they take out. Okay, now this came from another batch. And the batch that it came from, all those are souls that are also holy. However, when they're in the earth, we're all lost in the earth, and because of that, they are not considered to be of the holiest of the holy ones. 
they're not considered. They're considered not ready. Because this is the offering that's made of fine flour to Yahweh. So they're taken out first. These are it's going to be the first fruits of that. And they're taken out first. The other one, they're not ready. As Yahshua says, um, certain ones, he says, they're not worthy of me. Who cannot do this? Can I do that? Can I do this? Can I do that? They're not worthy of me. Well, he's not talking about worthy. That's how our scripture talks about it. All it's really talking about is we're not ready. The individual is simply not ready. And this is how it's, 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 uh, it's been uh, translated coming down to us that we are not worthy. However, everybody is worthy because Yahweh already said all Israel is going to be saved. So they're already worthy. Everyone is already worthy. Okay? We're just not ready. We have to wake up. We have to knock off the slumber and get going. This is what it's all about. So this is get going to the area that we become at one meant uh, with the Father. So we go a little further here. Okay. It says, with each of the lambs, with each of the seven lambs, the grain offering is to be one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil. Now, this is all saying something because, of course, we went to the three-tenths, we went to the two-tenths, and it's the one-tenth. It's all the same thing as we're talking about, that we're talking about with trumpets. It's talking about us separating ourselves, because that's what three is, if you remember what I was saying there. Okay? Two is a body. Is a body that is separated. This body is a body of witnesses. Witnesses are those who carry the testimony of the Father. In other words, they're the ones who can say what the Father says. That's who these guys are. Okay? And they are one. They are a unit. If you remember in the day of um, um, Pentecost, they were all gathered in one accord. One accord. They're taken. All that is simply symbolic of what Yahweh really is. Yahweh is one. Everyone who comes into that field and, 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 and realizes who they are, they become part of that one. That's why Yahweh is one. You and I, when we, we, when we atone, we have to be one. There's no if ands, or buts about it. We can't get around that. Because if Yahweh is one and you atone with one, you are one. And I am one. And this is how we're, we, we receive now names equal to sons and daughters. What are those names, guys? The same name, Yahweh. When Yahweh said, I have surnamed you, your surname is Yahweh. That's all it comes down. And the only reason why you're being surnamed is because you have brought forth that burnt offering, that sacrifice, and you have now become one because you, you and I have given up ourselves. Okay, so now we look at um, verse 11. It says, also include one male goat as a sin offering um, to make atonement for you in addition to the sin offering for atonement and the regular burnt offering which was prescribed. Now, if you look at this, guys, it's simply talking about the same thing that we saw taking place when trumpets came about. Because that's a sacrifice. It, one moves right into the other. Okay? One moves right into the other. It has to be the same people who heard the trumpet because the trumpet gave them the message of how to atone. And because the trumpet is a message. Trumpet is a message, and it gave them the message of how to atone. When they're atone, they could become once again part of that body, and they could actually assist their brother. They could become the leaves of the tree and the herbs that's going to heal the nations again, replacing those who are ruling the nations from another dimension at this point. They will be redeemed from among men. Hopefully we are all part of that. They'll take those offices or the tabernacle, if you will, okay, Feast of Tabernacle. They'll take those things, those offices at that point. And with that, them having that office, they once again have returned to their estate that they left. They have redeemed it. 
We've all redeemed what we have left in the first place because we made atonement. Atonement was made, and now we are one again with our Father. We're a pleasing, we're, we're, we're a pleasing aroma, and now we're not going to do anything except for what we see and we hear. So we, we're not going to rebel. We're not going to listen to the Luciferians this time. There's no listen to the Luciferians because we now were redeemed. We learned that lesson, and we won't be going that way anymore. Well, the next scripture I want you guys to go to today is Leviticus. Leviticus 4. Okay, let's go over to Leviticus 4, and we're going to read verse uh, 22 and, um, and 23. Okay, it says here, it says, when a ruler sins ignorantly and does not, and does what is forbidden in the law of Yahweh, our father, he is guilty. In other words, he has a blemish. That's all he's talking about. When he is made aware, you see that? We have to be aware. There has to be some kind of awareness. This is, this is, this is how you ascend. You ascend through your awareness, your consciousness. Okay? If you have, uh, if, if your consciousness is, is, is great, your awareness is great. If our consciousness is small, a pea-sized consciousness, well, we have a pea-sized awareness. That's what it comes to. When a ruler, I'm sorry, when he is made guilty of, of the sin, he has sinned, now he has spot and blemish, he shall bring as a sin offering a male goat. This is what the goat is all about. If we have done something that is not proper, that's all it's saying. When we come to the point with our offering, we have to make sure that we have put down all the things that has brought us guilt. All the things that has brought us guilt. So if we didn't do what Yahweh said to do, we're guilty. So the sin offering is for our guilt that we have so we get rid of it. We have none anymore. So it says here, he shall bring as a sin offering a male, um, um, a male of the goats, a male goat without blemish. That means, guys, we have to take care of the, tra the issues that we have. The issues that we have that have moved contrary to Yahweh because we can't get in to atone if we're carrying guilt. There's no atoning if we carry guilt. So notice now, we make connection and we have the trumpet. We make connection with our highest self because we made the right sacrifice. Our highest self ministers in the temple. You are the temple. Inside the temple, we have the altar of incense that the the priest, the regular priest, which is your higher self, tends to. Tends also to the seven lamb lampstand and tends also to the showbread. Tends to all of those. Now, when we become connected, this is the situation. Because when we become connected, we are being told how to atone. So now it's telling us with all the sacrifices that we gotta, we're, we're, we're making, the three, two, and one, it says with all that, we bring forth a male goat as a sin offering or as a guilt offering. Whatever we're guilty of, now we're going to put that down because our sacrifice has to be pleasing. We can't be pleasing if we don't bring a guilt offering to it. In other words, we can't be pleasing to our Father if we're guilty of something. Because make, make, remember, Yahweh is not going to um, just forgive the individual who is guilty. Remember, Yahweh compassionate, Yahweh merciful, Yahweh patient, all those things. He says, but not, but, but, but not forgiving the sins of the ones who are guilty. Because 
the ones who are guilty has to be fixed because they have done something that is not according to what Yahweh said so they can't be used in this in this in this um in this resurrection if you will or this redemption of you and I returning to our estates the reason why we left our estates in the first place is because we didn't do what we were supposed to be doing and we became guilty of that so to get back to our estate we have to do all that we were supposed to do in the first place and we won't be having guilt okay let's go over to um leviticus 23 guys leviticus 23 and this this scripture right here or this chapter right here everybody knows this as the feast chapter and we're going to look at verse 24 24 and this is atonement so physically now, that's what we do. But there's a, a spiritual meaning behind this. In 24, it says, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh moon, on the first of the moon, the moon, um, you should have a Sabbath. You should have a Sabbath. And this Sabbath is the memorial of blowing of trumpets, and it's a holy convocation. And we read what the trumpets was all about. We went on through that. Now, it, now it, it, we go down to verse 25, and it says, you should do no regular work on it. Okay? But you shall offer a fire made by fire to Yahweh. It says, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, verse 27 now, also on the tenth of the same moon, is the death atonement. It shall be a holy convocation to you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. Tribulation must come. We all have to go through that fire. It's all part of this offering. When we take ourselves from this vessel that we have here, this, this small, this, this the individual person, and bring it to a body, because we have to function as a body, and learn to work as a body, and if we're able to do that, we could bring forth the sacrifice that Yahweh is speaking about in the order in which he had showed Moshe to do. He told Moshe to tell the children of Israel, make sure you don't do as you're doing here today. Every man doing what is right in his own eyes. Guys, we have to come together as a body. That's why he's saying. That's what, that's what he was saying. We all just can't do whatever we want to do. We have to come together as a body, and we have to look at this thing that Yahweh has said and make sure that we do it. And surrender ourselves, put ourselves down. If we're able to put ourselves down, now we're good. Now we could do it if we're able to put ourselves down. Because this is where the sacrifice is at. Because when we empty up the self, then we could fill up with the spirit of Yahweh. If we are holding on to the self, then this ego that we have is, this is actually what fights against our Father. So atonement is necessary. Afflicting the soul or afflicting our, ourselves, it's necessary for us to see what's there. It's, it's necessary for us to see what's there. The great tribulation is necessary to see who is going to walk the walk, who won't faint, in order for us to get the holiest of the holy ones. It's all set up by your father already. There's no way around it. That's why tribulation must come. That's why temptation must come. If that doesn't come, there is no, there is no displaying of who the holy of the holy ones are. It's not there. You and I won't put down guilt. You and I won't put ourselves down. We won't be um, uh, uh, courageous. You know, courageous don't mean that you're, you're, you know, you won't be afraid at times. You know, courageous means in, in, the, in all the adversity and all the, the, the fear that may be there, you're going to have courage to go this, in spite of the fact that, yeah, you know, it, this, this thing may be scary, but you're going to go anyway. 
This is what courage is. And that's what Yahweh is asking us to get. He's not telling us that, hey, you can't, you, you can't have the emotion of fear ever. He's not saying that. He said he wants to give you courage. Okay, so now we go a little further. He said you should have no work you know, on that same day, or this is the day of atonement to make atonement for you in front of Yahweh, your father. Any person who is not afflicted on that same day, he shall be cut off from his people. What? That means if tribulation is not coming to you, you're not with the body. We're probably with the ones who are bringing the tribulation. So tribulation comes. It's necessary. It's all part of you coming to the point that you atone. It's all part of atoning. Just like you and I fasting and seeing what lives in us and dealing with that thing when it comes up, those emotions or attitudes when they come up, so we can put them down and, and put them under our higher man. There is no atoning without us seeing that and us taking charge of that. There is no atonement because everything has to be without spot and blemish. A guilt offering has to come forth or a sin offering has to come forth. That means we've got to put that down. And whatever we do, it has to be, a, it has to be pleasing to Yahweh. The only thing that is pleasing to Yahweh is when you do what he says and not what you and I want to do. This is the atonement sacrifice. This is the atonement sacrifice. Okay? The real atonement sacrifice. Of course, Moshe set it up with animals and, and, and a priesthood. And the priesthood went through all that. But if you remember what David said, he said, blessed is the one who understands the blowing of the trumpet. Well, he's not just talking about that. Because Shaul then later on came along and, and, and said that all those sacrifices that were being done, he said they, could, they couldn't take away sins. He couldn't. It's impossible. The only thing he could do is remind you that you had sin. But yet when Moshe set it up, he said, if you do it, your sins will be forgiven. Well, not at that point, because what he's talking about, and he said it, he said, Yahweh's going to raise somebody up. This is the one that you've got to listen to, because this is the one that's going to tell you all that I'm saying now. So he's going to tell you that you don't have to bring a sacrifice that I'm bringing right. I'm telling you to bring right now, because the reason why I'm telling you to bring this sacrifice is because y'all won't, y'all wouldn't do anything else than what than this anyway. So I have to do it like this at this point, and when this brother comes down the line, no, you be open to be ready for him because someone's going to come before him to make the soil fertile, so the seed that he drops could actually take root to those who are ready. This is what we're dealing with. Those who are ready. Okay? Everybody's worthy, but everybody is not ready. Okay. So the person who doesn't affect his soul, he's not a son. He can't be a son. Because for every son that Yahweh receives, he scourges. He spanks. He beats everything that needs to be moved out of him. He takes it out. And it's not easy. It's not fun for the one who is being scourged by the Father. He has to correct him. Okay. So any person who is, who is not uh, afflicted on that day has to be cut off. He is not, he, he's not ready. You should do no work no matter of work, at all, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations, in all your dwellings, wherever you may live. Now, it's obviously not talking, if you look at it in, in just a physical way, we're not going to grab that. But if we look at it in the spiritual, expand our minds to know that your dwelling places are the bodies in, in which you come into. As a body, 
which is more than the body, the individual body, you have ages in which you come into the earth. You have different incarnations and you have different ages that the body comes together. And it's all and this right here is a universal principle. But it's not a universal principle based upon how Moshe says up. And Moshe knew he couldn't he couldn't he couldn't stay there. He knew it wasn't universal, but he knew that's where the children of Israel were. But the intent of what he's saying, that is universal. That is the same thing that's coming from your source all the way down, replicating itself all the way down to the individual, all of us. He says right here in verse 32, it is to you a Sabbath of rest, and you shall afflict yourselves on the ninth of the moon at evening through the tenth of the moon at evening. From evening until evening, you shall celebrate your Sabbath. This Sabbath is a Sabbath of rest, but you know what it's talking about because you're going to afflict yourself and afflicting yourself, and when you have done this, this is your rest. This is how you're going to enter into the rest. When your father, when you have connected with your father, okay, and you have made the proper sacrifices, you and I have entered into the rest. This is the rest that everyone is looking for. Okay? This is the rest. Okay. So now, let's go over to Leviticus uh, chapter 16. Leviticus 6, chapter 16. And let's go ahead and read verse 16. It says, In this way you shall make atonement for the most holy place because of the uncleanness and rebellion of the children of Israel. Atonement. Atonement. Whatever their sins have been, he is to do the same for the tent of meetings which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. The tent of meetings remain amongst them. Now, your tent of meetings remain amongst you. It's in you. For the children of Israel, it was amongst that whole congregation. It was in the middle of them. Okay, so it's in us. It's in the middle of them. Okay, no one is... Um, no one is to be in the tent of meetings in the holy place from the time Aaron goes in to make atonement in the most holy place until he comes out. And first having made atonement for himself and his household and for the whole congregation of Israel, then he shall come out to the altar that is in front of Yahweh and make atonement for um, and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the blood or of the bull and some of the goat's blood and put it on the horns of the altar. Now remember where he's going. Remember where he's going. He's going into the holy place and going into the most holy place because this is the Day of Atonement. Notice what he's taking in there, guys. Look what he's taking in there. He's taking the blood of the bull, the young bull, or the lifestyle of this young bull, and the lifestyle of this goat that that was a guilt offering. So now the, it, it, it is guiltless. It doesn't have that anymore. Okay? It has taken that away. That's not there. That's been offered. That's not there. So he's going into the most holy place to meet the Father, to atone with the Father with blood. But blood of 
a bull, a young bull, and of a goat for a sin offering. Well, all he's really saying is this is a sacrifice you and I have to make. We have to become a son of Yahweh. And we got to give up the guilt. Because the guilt, all the guilt comes down to is what you and I know the Father has said to do, which we don't do. That's all it is. That's all it is. And this is the burnt offering that comes with those sacrifices. The burnt offering is the blood of the bull. He's going to take this bull, this blood. Okay, so we're looking at this now. Going a little further. He has to make atonement for these now. Okay, and so he's going to make atonement for himself, for his household, and for the whole congregation. So what he's got to make um, this for. And he's going to take the blood of bull and the goats, and he's going to put it on the horn of the altar. He shall sprinkle some of the blood on, um, on it with his finger seven times to cleanse it and to consecrate and to sanctify it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Now, this is all what Moshe had them doing, and it's all symbolic. It's all symbolic. So let's go to what we're talking about right here. Okay, because we're sprinkling something. Hey, okay, remember when you sprinkle it in the scriptures, it was purifying this. Purifying. And the blood, so you're purifying, you're purifying something, and the blood is the blood of Messiah, the blood that the, the, the example that was the life that was lived and the example that was left for us to follow. Okay? So this is actually what's going to purify us when we do that. So this is the blood that that has to go in. The blood that has to go in before your father is not a blood of a bull and a goat, but it's the lifestyle that we saw Messiah live. That's going to purify us because that's how the sprinkling is going to be happening. Okay? And the finger is an extension of our hands that we work with. So we have to do it. We have to do it. So this has to be sprinkled seven times. So we have to become complete without spot and blemish. Complete. That's all it's going to be. Okay? To cleanse it, consecrate, and sanctify it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. All we're looking at, guys, is how we make our sacrifice. All those symbols are simply telling us how to make the sacrifice. If we see the symbols, then we could go in. Because you don't have to go grab a, a bull or a goat. No. All you got to do is make sure that we here handle our business. As we saw that Yeshua did, so we do. Because that's the blood. That's the life. That's the sprinkling. We're sprinkling with our hands, our fingers. The fingers are an extension of our hands. So it's our own works that we're doing this with, our own works. If you see this, it's powerful because we ain't going to worry about someone else saving us because you know you got to save yourself. It's here. It's showing us how to save ourselves. Now let's go to chapter 29, I mean um, verse 29. Okay, verse 29. We're going to look at that now. Verse 29 says here, it says, the bull, the bull and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought into the most holy place to make atonement, must be 
must be eaten outside the camp. No, that's not what I want to read. Let's go to 29. It says, this shall be a statute forever for you. On the tenth day of the seventh moon, you shall afflict your souls. Okay? You must fast and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who sojourns among you. For on this day, or during this time period, on this day, that's what we're looking at today, but if we're looking at the body, what the body goes through, a day is a predetermined period of time. So it is. But the Father knows that time. You and I don't necessarily know it. For on that day, atonement will be made for you. So atonement will be made during the time of tribulation. Through much tribulation, we're going to enter into that rest. Through much tribulation, we're going to afflict our souls, and we're going to make that sacrifice and atone. Through much tribulation. Okay, so, for on that day, atonement will be made for you. Notice, to cleanse you from all your sins in front of Yahweh. All it is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated and ordained to succeed his father as high priest is to make the atonement. Sacrifices, that is. That means he is to go in there and make atonement for himself then for his family, then for the whole congregation. He is to put on the holy linen garment and make atonement for the most holy place, for the tent of meetings, and the altar, and for the priests, and for the people of the congregation. This shall be an everlasting statutes for you to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he, and he did as Yahweh commanded him. Now, once a year is once every, every age. So just have once a year, you have once an age. But, but if you look at it, when you connect and you go in, yours is eternal. You don't have to worry about it anymore in the age or in the day. That's only for those who haven't come out of it. Because we haven't come out of it right now, and so this is it's showing uh, uh, once a year. Okay, When there's a redemption of some of us, and we go um, back to our estates that we left, a new age is starting. And so in that age also, an atonement has to be made at the end of the age before those are taken into the fold also. I mean, it's all relative, man. We just, just got to see it like that. It's, it's, it's awesome. I mean, it's something that is... Is, is really prevalent. Now, let's go over to Isaiah chapter 58. Because Isaiah chapter 58 is going to show us the importance of this afflicting of the individual, the connections that we make. Okay, so 58, let's look at verse, let's look at verse 1 um, real quick. Verse 1, 58 and verse 1. It says, cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, like a trumpet, because you are also that same trumpet. When you, when you, when you get what the Malachim says, it's not for you alone. You are going to give the message. So when he says, lift up your voice like a trumpet, it's not necessarily talking, go out there shouting this and that. No, it's a message. Just like the message of the, of the, 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 uh, the Malachim. It's a vibration. It's a frequency. You are speaking this, and people 
is going into people and they're able to hear it and show my people their, their transgressions by just like the Malachim does and the house of Yaakov their sins yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways like a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinances of their father, they ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching Yahweh. This is as far as they know at least. They say, why have we fasted and you, Yahweh, do not see it? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, this is the reason, in the day of your fast, or you can put your day of your affliction there, okay, you found pleasure. So when the time of tribulation comes up and you and I had to drop things and, and move as, as that woman did into her place, we chose not to. We chose to return to Egypt. This is our pleasure, okay? Because in Egypt, we could eat and drink and we could have fun. So this is what we want to do. Okay, so they're, they're doing all this. So behold, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. We pursue profit. We can't let go of certain things. And exact your labors. Behold, you fast for strife and debate. And the strike with the fist of wickedness. You cannot fast as you do this day and expect your voice to be heard on high. We can't fast like that because obviously that's not bringing the sin offering. That's not bringing the, great, the, the burnt offering. That's not bringing forth that bull. That's not bringing forth that ram. It's none of them. Those, those things are symbolic, and we just lost them right there because we're doing, we, we decide to do these that we're reading about here in Isaiah 58, and we forgot to do what Yahweh said. So we can't atone. Our voice cannot be heard on high in the first place for us to be atoned with. Okay. In this, is this the kind of fast I have chosen? The day for a man to afflict his body, is it only for bowing one head, one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that all there is to your fast or the afflicted of the soul? Will you call that an acceptable day to Yahweh? Would you call that an acceptable burnt offering? Did we give up ourselves, or did we, are we going here fighting and arguing? When we saw that fight and arguing was in us because we afflicted our souls and then eat, did we manage it, or did we blow off the handle and do exactly what we were not supposed to do? We didn't manage it. Well, we get another opportunity. Because I told, as I told you, it simply comes down to us not being ready. If we are ready, we're going to manage it. If we're not ready, we're not going to manage it. That's all it comes down to me. Either we could do it or we can't. In verse 6, is this not the kind of fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness. So notice what it does, guys. It looses us from the prison that we have actually fallen into. The Day of Atonement and what we're doing right now and realizing what it actually means and doing that, it actually could release us from the prison that we are now living in and expressing ourselves through. That's powerful. This will give us Loose the hands of, of wickedness. To undo the heaven burden, to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke. 
every yoke, every responsibility that you have for them, every duty that you have for them, you break everything that's holding you down, you break it. Is it not to share your bread? This is showing love, compassion, mercy. With the hungry, and that you bring to your house the poor, same thing, compassion, mercy. Who are cast out when you see the naked, that you, that you uh, cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh? Well, these are all talking about physical things. At the same time, it's talking about spiritual things. It's telling you what to do physically and telling you what to do spiritually. But you got to understand the spiritual part before you're able to fulfill the physical part. I'm not just saying take anybody into your house. No, but it's not just saying cover everybody. Because it's not talking about a physical covering. It's not, it's not talking about taking the physical person into your house. Well, you can do that and display that. Those, those kind things, awesome. But it's going beyond that. The fatherless or the widow are those who don't have a head. That's what it is. Those who don't recognize their father, and your father is also Ishi, your father is husband. That's what it's talking about. The fatherless and the widow, those who are outside of the covenant of Yahweh. How do you cover him? You cover him with the clothing of Yahweh. Same laws, the same prophets, you cover them. How do you take them into your house? Because when you do that, they are Yahweh is actually leading them back to the tabernacle from which they fell in the first place. That's their home. Going right back to their home. The estate that we had that we decided to leave when we decided to cause us, allow ourselves to become imprisoned by that which should have been there to serve us. We ended up serving those forces. Well, I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I'm, I'm out of time. Okay? So notice verse 7. Okay. Verse 7 says, at the very end it says, and to, not, and to not hide yourself from your own flesh. Well, your flesh and my flesh, that's our nature. If our nature is actually something that is, you know, coming up because we're afflicting it, we can't hide ourselves from that flesh. Because what we have to do, we have to Bring it in line. We have to make that sacrifice and cause our ego to serve the higher man. So when it says, do not hide from your flesh, don't hide from any of our faults. Don't make excuses for anything. Because if we do, we're not going to make that sacrifice. Because that's all part of the sacrifice of atonement. It's not just simply bringing blood of bulls and goats. It's not simply making a, 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 a grain offering. It's much more than that. Much more than that. Notice what he says here in verse 8. Then your light will break through like the noonday. Our light, that which caused us to see, the light is in us, guys. The light, the seven lamp lampstand, it will come on and show us how to go through that veil and to meet our Father. This is what it's talking about. And this is how we atone. 